We do greet you this evening in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. What a blessing it is to gather here. Last year, I was honored and privileged to introduce the congressman, and um, and I was told this year uh, you need to do a little bit more than asking everybody to raise their hand that that knew that know the congressman. <laughs> and so, with that, I will be obedient. But um, a couple of days ago. Um, I was online and I saw something and I said that's it and so I think brother Tony has it queued up brother Tony oh great all right and so you may have already viewed this and the congressman knows what I'm, perhaps he knows what I'm about to say but he will know when he looks back at that monitor uh, at that screen behind us and so what that, this, a minute, I think it's a minute and 37 seconds, it represents this giant in our community. He is known as a historian, and he will take us through the annals of history. But you may not know there is, he has a heart of gold. Amen, somebody. Amen. And so, I think that's enough that I've said and so I would just direct your attention to the screen. The Lord ceremony honored military veteran members of the Congressional Black Caucus. It happened Tuesday for one congressman from the East. It's a moment he won't soon forget. Not your science, Brandon Truitt joins us now with the details. Shayla, yeah, it is a moment that he says he's never going to forget and thought would never happen. And it was all caught on video. Butterfield was honored for his service in the military from 1968 to 1970. Now, right here is a video of the event that's posted on Twitter. The top honoree was General Colin Powell. Butterfield has said that he never was able to serve with an African-American general because they were extremely rare during the Vietnam War. Well, yesterday, Butterfield got his chance at that salute, and he said it was a moment that silenced the room. What this all means to him, he says he couldn't help but think of the servicemen and women who came before him. Butterfield says he was just honored to be one of those veterans recognized and that General Powell didn't know it was going to happen. And when I spoke with him today, he told me that he couldn't help but get emotional over all of this, saluting someone that he calls one of our nation's finest four-star generals. days ago, I uh, was honored by the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation for being one of the few veterans who serve at the Congressional Black Caucus. There are about five of us who uh, are, are veterans, and so we were honored that evening, and of course the celebrity that evening was General Colin Powell. And in planning the event, I told the organizers that I would accept the award that evening, but that I wanted a point of personal privilege that I wanted to be able to salute General Powell that evening. And they granted my request, Bill Pitt. Uh, they granted my request. And uh, General Powell did not know it was going to happen after he received his award. Uh, they asked him to stand there at the podium, and then I was called up to the podium. And I said the following, and I stood at attention. General Powell, 50 years ago, I was drafted into the United States Army reported to basic training on the day that Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated. During my two years of service, sir, never ever did I see an African-American general. My father served in World War I, served in the Battle of the of Elise Lorraine on the battlefield of France. He always wanted to see his hero, General Benjamin O. Davis Sr., but he never saw him. 
Sir, on behalf of my father, on behalf of my childhood friends who paid the ultimate sacrifice in the jungles of Vietnam, yeah. sir, I salute you tonight on their behalf. Then I gave him a salute. General Powell and his wife. And so thank you very much for, for playing that video this evening and, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, to my pastor, Reverend E. Ray Bynum, thank you for your friendship, thank you for your leadership, thank you for all that you mean, not only to this church, but, but to our community. And to Reverend Maurice Bard, I can make a speech about Harry Maurice Bard, but we will save that for another, another day. <laughs> To Pastor Taylor Loveland, thank you, and to the bishops here tonight, Bishop Daniels and Bishop Terry, Bishop M.K. Smith, and all of the other clergy here assembled. Uh, to the Mount Zion Choir, uh, thank you for coming and sharing your talents uh, with us this evening. To um, Linda Cooper Subs, uh, who worked day and night to make this program happen today, and she did not do it by herself. She had a committee working with her, but thank all of you uh, for your incredible work in bringing this program uh, to the community, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And I want to thank you for having this program here at Jackson Chapel First Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, this is my church, founded in 1872, uh, a church that has done so much in this community down through the years, so much which has actually been forgotten uh, down through the years. A lot of things happened within these four walls in the 1940s, in the 1950s, in the 1960s, but I certainly don't have time to go into that either. Uh, but thank you so very much for having the program at this church. Uh, I bring greetings to you. I cannot bring greetings to you from the President of the United States of America. When Barack Obama was President, I would always begin my speech by bringing greetings from the President, but I dare not do that tonight. Because I know what message you would give me to take back to him. And it's not suitable for the house of the Lord. But I do bring greetings to you from my friends in Washington. I left my car this morning at 8.30 and got here at 12.30 this afternoon and just been in constant motion since that time. But let's talk about African American history, Black History Month. When I was a kid, it was, it was Negro History Week. And then it grew into Black History Month, and now some refer to it as African American History Month. But my friends, you cannot understand the present. You cannot understand 2018 without a full understanding of the past, because it makes no sense at all. And so whenever I give these presentations, I like to, to first of all remind audiences that slavery was not something that lasted for two or three years. Slavery in America lasted for 245 years. Slavery began in America in 1619, but I, I won't go back that far. I will start in the year of 1830, 1831. There were about three million slaves in the South. Uh, in North Carolina, there were about 200 and some thousand slaves right here in North Carolina. Wilson County did not exist uh, during that time. Uh, we were part of Edgecombe County, uh, but Wilson did not exist, and so there were 15,000 people in Edgecombe County, and Wilson was part of Edgecombe County. Nash County had some 5,000. Halifax County had another 10,000. And so there were literally about 30,000 slaves who lived within 50 miles of this church. And so that's where we began. And so I want to thank you for your willingness to listen to this tonight. I want to thank the elected officials for coming tonight and to, to be a part of this ceremony because much of their success uh, in their political careers can be attributed to some of the things that I'm going to talk about tonight. I want to recognize the elected officials, Representative Gene Farmer Butterfield, uh, and Mayor Rose, Mayor C. Bruce Rose, and Mayor Joyce Richard Brown. Some of you may not know Judge Brown, 
Judge Brown. Joyce Brown, but she is the mayor of Williamston, North Carolina. <laughs> Wynn Wilson, I just <laughs> Wynn Wilson has a zip code of 27893, and Williamston is 27892. And uh, we always joke about that, but thank you, Mayor, for coming tonight, and to my sheriff, Sheriff Woodard. It's always good to, to see you and to Councilman Creech. Yes. We've come a long ways in terms of African Americans being elected to, to public office, and so some of what I'm talking about tonight will explain the political progress that we have made. But in 1830, not only did we have some 200,000 slaves in North Carolina, but we had somewhere around 20,000 black people who were not slaves. They were called free people of color. And these individuals were highly intelligent. They were in business. Uh, they had managed to get their freedom by various means. And they were free people of color. And they felt that they had an obligation to the slaves. They felt that they had to do all that they could do to reach back and to provide some relief uh, to the slaves. And so they were teaching the slaves how to read and write. They were, some of them became ministers and clergy and they started teaching and preaching to the slaves. And finally in 1830, that became a threat to the whole institution of slavery that these free people of color were reaching back trying to help their brothers and sisters who were enslaved. And so in 1830, the North Carolina legislature passed a law that says, whereas the teaching of slaves to read and write has a tendency to excite dissatisfaction in their minds and to produce insurrection and rebellion to the injury of the citizens of this state. It is hereby enacted by the General Assembly that any person who shall teach or even attempt to teach any slave to read or write shall be liable to indictment. And if they shall be convicted, if it's a white person, they shall be fined not less than $100, nor more than $200. If it is a free person of color who commits the crime, they shall be whipped, not exceeding 39 lashes, nor less than 20 lashes. The third one. If it is a slave trying to teach a slave to read and write, they don't get carried to court, Justice Earls. They get carried before the justice of the peace. And when they are convicted, they shall be sentenced to a punishment of a mandatory 39 lashes on their bare back. That was the punishment imposed in 1830 for anyone to teach a slave to read and to write. But then, my clergy friends, the legislature went further. It then decided to regulate ministers and pastors and individuals who were attempting to preach to the slaves. They passed another law that says this is an act to regulate the conduct of free persons of color and slaves. It shall not be lawful for any free person of color or slave to preach or exhort in public or in any manner to officiate as a preacher or teacher in any prayer meeting or other association for worship where slaves of different families are collected together. If any free person of color or slave shall be convicted before any court having jurisdiction he shall, for each offense, receive not exceeding 39 lashes on his bare body. And wherein a slave shall be guilty of a violation, he shall be taken before a magistrate and receive 39 lashes on his bare back. And so in 1831, the whole antebellum movement, the, the era preceding the end of slavery, came to an end. People, black people of color became fearful of that if they would teach the slaves and preach to the slaves and bad things would happen to them. 
And so, that much happened. Finally, in 1860, Abraham Lincoln is running for president. Abraham Lincoln is in a very spirited race for president. Southern states were very fearful of Abraham Lincoln. They feared that if he was elected to the presidency, that he would take away their slaves. And so the South was just in arms, very upset about this man from Illinois uh, named Abraham Lincoln who was running for president. And so they, the South did not support Lincoln. Lincoln, as we all know, was elected president in November 1860. A few days later, seven states, seven Southern states left the Union. They left the United States. They said, we are out of here. We, we are not going to be a part of the United States of America. We don't like Abraham Lincoln. We feel that he is positioning himself to take away our slaves, and we are not going to have any part of it. We're going to start our own country called the Confederate States of America. And then a few weeks later, Lincoln takes the oath of office as president. And then four more states leave the Union. So now we have 11 southern states who are rebelling against the Union over the question of slavery. And the Civil War breaks out. North against the South. Thousands and thousands of Americans were being killed every day during the Civil War. Finally, in 1862, Lincoln became very weary of the war. He was tired of, of blood being shed on the battlefield in the North and the South. September 22nd of 1862, Lincoln said to the Southern states, look y'all, I'm going to give you 100 days to come back into the Union. I'll give you 100 days. This is September 22nd. If you're not back into the Union by January 1st of 1863, I'm going to use my power as President and Commander-in-Chief to take away your slaves. You've got to come back into the Union. The Southern states ignored President Lincoln. And finally, on January 1st of 1863, President Lincoln signed that famous document that we all know as the Emancipation Proclamation. What the proclamation said was that all states, all 11 states that are now rebelling against the Union, I'm using my power as the commander of the military, commander-in-chief, to take away your slaves because you are benefiting from their services as we are engaged in war. And so I'm going to take away your slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation did not address the states that did not leave the Union, who also had slaves. They are called the border states. And so the Emancipation Proclamation was defective. It was legally defective because it only applied to the 11 states that had left the Union. Lincoln felt that he didn't he didn't have the authority to do it in the border states. And so, as time went on, some of the slaves were set free, many of them were not set free. But then a legal controversy uh, blew up. And the legal controversy was whether or not Lincoln exceeded his authority as president to do what he did. Southern plantation owners said, you cannot do this to us. This is our property. We bought and paid for these slaves. We own them. They are our property. You cannot take away our property. And Lincoln's response was, yes, I can. We are at war. I am the commander of the military, and I have the power to do that, and I have done just that. So finally, other slaves were set free, but not all of them. And by this time, it was 1864, and it was time for Lincoln to run again for president. You know, these four years uh, come around pretty fast, and I wish this four years would come around pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. But now it's, I promised Linda I wouldn't be political tonight, because this, this is not a political rally. But 1864 came along again, and Lincoln runs for re-election, and he wins. And after he wins the second time, then he's on the home stretch now because he can't run for a third time. 
So Lincoln said, I'm going to do the right thing. And what Lincoln did was to propose an amendment to the Constitution. He said, okay, if this proclamation is not worth the papers written on, I'm going to show you how to do it. We're going to propose a 13th Amendment. We're going to add it to the Constitution. And that amendment is going to enshrine the rights of black people into the law and set them free once and for all. We will end slavery. And so after Lincoln won the second time, he proposed the 13th Amendment. It passed Congress on January 31st of 1865. But that was a catch. Constitutional amendments cannot be just passed by the Congress. It has to be passed by a certain number of states. I forgot whether it's two-thirds or three-fifths, but it has to be passed by a certain number of states in order for it to become law. And so Lincoln started sending this amendment around to the states. The first state was, was uh, Illinois, his home state, February 1st of 1865. And finally, it reached North Carolina on December 4th of 1865, and finally to the state of Georgia on eight, December 6th of 1865. But along the way, Abraham Lincoln did not see the, the result of his work because on April 15th of that year, it was passed by Congress in January, it was finally ratified in December. On April 15th of 1865, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. And so a new president stepped in, a, the vice president stepped in, he was a southerner, and tried to take over the leadership that Abraham Lincoln had started. And so, I give you all of that background to say that starting in 1865, You've got four million slaves who are now free. They are now entitled to the full benefits of citizenship. They had very little. They had no property, had no money. The only thing they had was faith in God, faith in family, faith in community, and faith that their government would be there for them in the time of need. And so the federal government set up the Freedmen's Bureau and started doing great things to, to enhance the, the, the survival of the slaves. And the South hated it because they had lost their property, they had lost their maids and their servants and the people to work in their fields and to gather their crops. They hated it vehemently. And finally, I'll fast forward to 1876. Black people were getting elected to Congress. Black people, Jane, were getting elected to state legislatures all across the South. In South Carolina, there were more African Americans in the state legislature in South Carolina who were African American than white legislators. They were getting elected all across the South. Finally, in 1876, Rutherford B. Hayes is running for president. Sam Tilden running for president. These two men opposing each other. And some say that it was a tie vote in the Electoral College, not the popular vote. And we all know about the Electoral College from, you know. <laughs> but some say that was a tie vote in the Electoral College. And these two men went in a room and closed the door. And Tilden made a concession offer to Hayes. And he said, Rutherford B. B. Hayes, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to walk away and give you this election, but you've got to promise me one thing, that you're going to end Reconstruction in the South. And that was the political deal that was cut between these two men. And so starting in 1877, Reconstruction came to an end, and bad things started happening to African Americans. The Ku Klux Klan uh, sprung up and started committing lynchings all across the South. A few African Americans continued to get elected to office. You should know that there were four African American congressmen who represented Wilson County during Reconstruction. Yes, they did. Four African American congressmen. John Hammond, 1875 to 1877. James O'Hara, 1883 to 1887. Henry Plummer Cheatham, 1889 to 1893 and the famous George H. White from 1897 to 1901. But as the century was closing out, as we were getting close to the end of the 1800s, 
white people decided to become really violent. They went into Wilmington and started the Wilmington Race Riot. Not white people, the extremists, uh, the, the Klan, if you will, went into Wilmington and started the 1898 Wilmington Race Riot, which was just devastating to that community. And so finally, in 1900, the North Carolina legislature decided to do something very, very potent, and that was to enact a literacy test. That is, to make everybody come off of the voter registration rolls and then allow them to come back and re-register to vote again. And in re-registering, you had to be able to read, you had to be able to write, and you had to be able to satisfy the registrar that you were literate. And so you know what happened? All of the people were kicked off the voter registration rolls when white citizens came back to register to vote. They were allowed to register. African Americans came to register to vote. They were denied. So starting in 1900, African Americans were completely disfranchised, disenfranchised from the political process in Wilson and in America. Well, we're into a new century now. Uh, black people in Wilson are beginning to grow, and Wilson is beginning to prosper as a community. 1910 comes along. Booker T. Washington comes into Wilson. Dr. Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was a national leader. He was a national educational leader. Uh, he felt very strongly about education. He was the president of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. He was in a little competition with W.E.B. Du Bois, who was in New York, uh, who had some different views about how African Americans should empower themselves. And so these two men were really at odds with each other, Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois. So on November 1st of 1910, Booker T. Washington came into Wilson on a train two blocks from this church. And he had an entourage of people traveling with him. And they were picked up at the train station and they were brought down Nash Street to this corner. And that's when Booker T. Washington helped, some say, lay the cornerstone of this church. I'm still uh, not certain about that, uh, Ms. Pitt. Uh, but he did something. I don't know if it was groundbreaking or, or what it was. Because this church really wasn't dedicated until 1950. Uh, but he was here in 1910, and I think he was here when the ground was broken for this church. That's when his entourage made the turn here at Pender Street and went to Green Street and made a right turn and went down to 622 Green Street. And that's where they stayed that night. Got up the next morning, he made a speech that night at the Wilson Colored Graded School, uh, which was down, uh, down South Pender Street, I call it. Um, and, and made a speech that night, and hundreds, if not thousands, of people in Wilson came out to hear the famous Booker T. Washington. The reason I give you all of that detail was because when Booker T. went back to Tuskegee, the chairman of his board was named Julius Rosenwald. And Rosenwald asked um, uh, Dr. Washington, how do things go on your education tour in North Carolina? And he said, it's absolutely pathetic. It's pathetic. Why is it pathetic? It's pathetic because when I went into the city of Wilson, there was a small school there where Negro children could attend up until the sixth grade. It was called the Wilson Colored Graded School. And in fact, I went there and made a speech that night. But that's the only school, the only public school in that community. And if you are outside of the city of Wilson, out in the county, there, is no, there are no educational opportunities. There are none. These black families would have children. They would have no education at all. When they got to be 9, 10, 11 years old, they went to work in the fields. And what we need, Mr. Rosenwald, you're a rich man, Mr. Rosenwald, what we need from you, sir, is to use your wealth and to build some schools in the South, not just in North Carolina, I want you to build some schools uh, all across the South so these poor rural children in communities like Wilson and Edgecombe County can get an education. And Rosenwald accepted that challenge. 
and used his wealth to build 5,000 <coughs> schools in the South. Mm. The largest number of those schools were right here in North Carolina, 537 as I recall, were right here in North Carolina, and 14 of those Rosenwald schools were right here in Wilson County. And I've got the names of all 14 of those Rosenwald schools. Uh, Mrs. Pitt sitting back there, her mother, she doesn't even know that I know this. Her mother was a principal of one of those Rosenwald schools. Diane Myers sitting over there, her mother taught at one of those Rosenwald schools. And the list, I know somebody saying my mama too. Uh, but <laughs> but they, they were the old teachers of yesteryear who went to work in those Rosenwald schools and they, they trained hundreds and thousands of, of black children in Wilson to get an education. So as the years went on, uh, Mercy Hospital was founded over on Green Street to give health care uh, to African Americans in this community. And that was a big deal. So finally, as time goes on, and I'm running out of time, let me take you up now to, to 1947, the year I was born. Yes, some of you were born too. Because <laughs> I know you. <laughs> Let me take you to 1947. Black people in Wilson could not register to vote because of the literacy test. This church called a pastor to stand where I am standing right now, named Talmadge Watkins, Reverend Watkins, called him to Wilson to pastor this church. And Watkins came in here from Fairville. And when he came here, the chairman of his deacon board was named G.K. Butterfield Sr. Is that right over there? And these two men put their heads together. And they said, you know, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start an NAACP chapter in Wilson. And we're going to get this thing going. And we're going to be about the business of voter registration. And that's what they did. They formed the NAACP chapter in this church. They put their heads together, and every Saturday morning they would get black people together and, and teach them how to pass this literacy test when they go down to the courthouse to try to register to vote. And then they got slick. My dad and Reverend Watkins got slick. They said, what we're going to do now, instead of registering people all over town who are African American, we're going to concentrate on Ward 3. See, back then the city council had districts, where well, they have districts now. They had what they call wards. They had six wards. And where we're sitting right now is called Ward 3. And Ward 3 started at Ward Boulevard and went all the way up to Dick's Hot Dog Stand. And it was two blocks wide. It was just like this. It was from Nash Street over to Green Street. Two blocks wide and about a mile and a half long. And the reason they drew that map in that fashion was because the, the, city's, the city fathers knew that the day would come uh, when 